Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. Can you please be seated? Sorry. <laughs> right. Um, we've just got a few things we need to go through first. Can I ask you to please be quiet? Um, during the meeting, all participants will be in control of their own um, microphones. So it's the button at the front, it's got the mouth with the things coming out of it. And then once you finish speaking, turn it off again. Um, you're speaking, remember to turn it off when you, you've finished. All reports published are taken as read. We just want like a small synopsis of, of what's going on. Um, We've received apologies tonight from Councillor Cathy Douse and for leaving early for Councillor Sam Littlewill. So thank you very much. Um, no urgent business. Um, are there any declarations of interest? I see none. Um, so item five to be presented by Detective Chief and Superintendent Trevor Laurie. Thank you for coming along. Mr. Dory, if you'd like to commence. Yeah, sure. Um, if, I, I'll take it as you say that um, people have, uh, have had the pack and, and have read through it. But if I can pull out a few pieces just as we go through. Yes. I, I'm sure they will. I'm sure they will. Um, so if I can just. Could I, sorry, can I just, just interrupt? Yes, Ollie. Yeah, I think. You didn't say anything about the last minute so that you can sign it. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Jeff. That's all right. Can we take the last minutes as read? Any matters arising? No. no. Do you want me to sign those now? Thank, thank you, Olu, for that. Yeah, sure. Um, Good evening. If I, if I take it that, um, as you say, people have read through uh, the PowerPoint, um, but I'll pull out a few pieces, uh, if I may, that I think might assist. So just in relation to stop Could I just search. also say there's a lot of acronyms in there that um, some of us, we've, yeah. we've managed to work out most of them, but if you could uh, I, I, say I, what they are, that would yeah. be most grateful. Thank you. Yeah, and apologies. This, unfortunately, this isn't my PowerPoint. It was, it was done. So, um, but I, I will try and explain them as we go through. So I think the thing, first of all, with stop and search is you'll notice that uh, across the Met, stop and search is falling. Um, and we're falling at a similar sort of rate in, in Greenwich. Uh, but what we're seeing is, is that whilst the, the numbers of stop and search are falling, the actual positive outcome rate, which is the POR, is, is, is improving which is where you'd probably want to be. You want to be more of uh, less people not being stopped and searched where they, we don't find anything. Um, I will just point out, because it, it doesn't make it very clear uh, in, in here, is the purpose of stop and search uh, is in order to make sure that we don't arrest people that we don't need to. So every single person that we have a power to stop and search, we actually have a power to arrest them. So the purpose of power stop and search is, is to actually then go on and find, if you've got something, you then search, uh, you then uh, arrest them. If you haven't, then you allow them to go on their way at that time. Uh, and that sometimes gets missed. And the other thing I would just pick up with stop and search before we go any further is a lot of people feel or believe that they've been stopped and searched when actually they haven't been stopped and searched as per the law. So if we stop a vehicle and we ask who's in the vehicle and what they're doing and where they're going, that's not a stop and search. It's actually a road traffic stop. So that doesn't count any of those. Uh, and I only, I only raise that because when I speak to a lot of people about them being stopped and searched, they see the word stopped by the police and searched by the police uh, as, as the same thing when sometimes it's just a case that they've been stopped. Um, You'll see, um, as you go through, uh, through the pack, the main reason for, for stop and search uh, is primarily drugs, um, followed by um, uh, a, a sort of a grouping but, but, uh, of different things, which is the all other searches. Uh, and the third um, area, which is probably the area that I would like to increase more, is the weapons. 
so that we're actually stopping and searching people for weapons. Um, I think the, it's, it's a ratio basis, but you would like to see that start to increase as a ratio that we're stopping people for weapons, because that's really what we would like to do to take those off the street. Um, you'll see in terms of the sort of demographics, um, we actually stop more white people than we stop uh, black people, but that's, um, you know, again, when you look at the ratio of, uh, of the makeup of Greenwich, um, there is a disproportionality in there. So whilst we stop more white people in, in pure volume numbers, what you find is, is that we're, you know, that's about 48%, whereas Greenwich is roughly in the census about 58% white, uh, and we stop 40% uh, of our black people, and the census is about 21%. So there is still a disproportionality there. Um, what I would say is that doesn't tell the whole story, because what so, um, when you look at disproportionality, you look at disproportionality across some, a borough like Greenwich, it doesn't take into account where the stop was and what the, the demographic was of that location. So, for instance, you know, at certain times and certain days, the pop, you know, in Woolwich Town Centre, for instance, where we are now, the demographics may be vastly different to the demographics of the whole borough, but we've got no way of measuring that. Um, you do find um, uh, the other area um, that uh, is just worth noting, st stop and search predominantly occurs with younger male people. So they're, they're, they're males in, in the vast majority uh, and they tend to be in the younger age range. So, they t so you'll see there it's about a quarter is, are under 18. Um, the rest of them are, are in the category 18 plus, but when you break it down, you find that it's predominantly sort of 26 and under uh, is where the vast majority of people have stopped and searched. Um, moving on um, to um, what are called MTIP searches, which is um, uh, not, uh, not a particularly helpful um, uh, acronym if you don't know what that means, but this is, this is where, where there's what's called more thorough searches where intimate parts, so this would be strip searching. Um, so there's been 59 uh, strip searches uh, that have occurred. We can't break that down for Greenwich because they either occur in Lewisham or they occur in Bexley because that's where we have our police stations that have got what are called MTIP rooms. So it's actually quite difficult to say how many of them are Greenwich residents without going into each individual record and finding uh, that information out. What you do, what you do see, um, the two areas that I would sort of flag to you is the positive outcome rate on um, strip searching goes up a lot higher. So when we do undertake strip searching, we tend to find something uh, more often than not, so it's around 58%. But you do also potentially see the disproportionality, so we, we actually strip search more black people than we do white people, um, which is at odds. I would just caution slightly about making too many jumps around that because the numbers are so low, so 59 searches, you've only got to have one or two in, in one category and the other and, and they would have such a large, but it is an area that I would, uh, I, I'm keen to um, examine more. Anybody that's strip searched that's under the age of 18 actually ha goes through a, a completely separate governance structure where they're all, they are all scrutinized individually for the sort of legality of it and how the, the search was taken, uh, taken place. Um, when it comes on to the sort of supervision, um, we, um, we pride ourselves uh, on um, making sure that, you know, in, in near enough all occasions, our uh, stop and search records are supervised. Um, we're, we're operating at a 99.3% um, uh, supervision rate uh, for that and that 75% of them are supervised within, uh, within the sort of 72 hours of them being created, which again gives me the level of confidence that my sergeants are doing what they should be doing um, by checking what their constables are doing. The other area that I'm, I'm keen to maintain is the use of body-worn video. So you'll see that the Met um, has an aim to be at 90%, we're actually exceeding that, so 96.5%, yeah, 96.5% of all stop and search has the body-worn video on at the time. There's always going to be occasions where uh, you can't reach 100%. It's almost impossible because there's going to be occasions where officers haven't got body-worn video for whatever reason. They've, they've, they've run out of the police station and they haven't got that. 
the, the system fails, um, or the other area that you get is what's called the user area, where officers press the, think they've pressed the button, um, haven't checked, you know, they, they go straight into whatever it is they're dealing with and then find out that actually it's not recorded. Um, but again, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's fairly low numbers. Um, in terms of scrutiny, I think, you know, there's lots of, uh, lots of scrutiny that takes place around stop and search. It's probably the area of, of policing that has the l largest amount of scrutiny um, from both communities uh, and, and internally and externally. Um, that's not to say that that can't be improved. I think the one area that I would, I would welcome greater scrutiny around is when you look at the people that are scrutinizing us around stop and search, it tends not to be the people that are likely to be stopped and searched. And I think we have a challenge, uh, not just in this forum, but in many forums, to actually start to in increase the voices of those people that are, are uh, at the end of our services. Um, so that's a piece of work that, um, that I've asked Sally that would, would be here to actually start to look at doing. How do you get people that are more likely to be stopped and searched in the scrutiny? Because they're the people that will tell you how it's done. Interestingly, um, when people look at the stop and search, they tend to, um, they tend to give fairly positive feedback. Um, I actually, uh, and that's because we, we tend to comply very well with the law. So we tend to be, yeah, so we tend to follow, we tend to follow the, the processes, you know, officers are well trained to follow the processes, go through the legal requirements that's, that's required. The bit that I'm more interested in is, is actually how are the officers doing it, how are they talking to people, how are they engaging with people, um, how many of them are there. Um, I think one of the challenges that, um, that we face uh, in, in the Met in general is that quite often you'll stop and search to say two two young people but there'll be eight or nine police officers there you know and, and that's that it, it it's it increases the, the feeling and fear that i think people have and and that's an area that um, that i've asked for uh, some additional work to be done um the only, um, the only last piece I would um, just flag for you, um, and I'm happy if you want me to stop at this stage and take questions or, or move on, is um, all of the data that's here is actually publicly available in the Met's, uh, in the Met's dashboard uh, for stop and search. It's, it's actually a very useful tool to be able to drill into the data uh, and, and ask the questions, and it, you know, I'm quite happy outside of here if you've got additional questions having looked at the data we you know I'll, we'll take those uh, you know as they come because it really is an area that um, you know I'm quite uh, quite willing to sort of say how do you do it better um, that the um, I, I, I've worked around stop and search for many years uh, and my um, I, how, how it's very useful at taking knives and weapons off the street. It's very useful for taking drugs off the street, but it does always have and runs the, the risk of searching people who haven't got anything on them. Uh, and I think that's, you know, that's always a difficult area. I think the question that I would pose to people is, if we weren't to, to do stop and search, what is the alternative? What else would we do in order to do that? So. I'm, I'm happy to sort of stop at that stage and take questions, or do you want me to go all the way through the um, No, if you can, st we could take some questions now, if that's okay. Yes, Chris. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, do I call it Detective Chief Superintendent, or Trevor, or Mr? <laughs> Trevor's fine. It, it's a bit of a mouthful, and um, it's been a long day. Uh, th thank you very much, Trevor. Um, and, and I do appreciate uh, you stopping there, because... Um, Obviously, you rightly anticipated that it is an area that gets uh, a lot of attention, and rightly so. Um, I'm also grateful that um, you've, 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 you've obviously gone into this and you've given us quite a lot of data around it. And it is really reassuring to see that this data is, is gathered, but importantly, scrutinised, because data without scrutiny is just stuff. Um, now, you, you talked around it, around the proportionality of uh, those that are stopped and searched in, in Greenwich. And um, 
I'll, I'll, I'll go straight in with, with the issue. There is a feeling, particularly uh, in the black community, and I represent a ward with a very large black community, uh, that they are targeted for stop and search. So it would be, and I, I, you, I know you've probably done this at this panel before, but not, not a, a session that I've been here. Would you be able to give a little bit more of uh, uh, a narrative to how those searches come about? Because you said it's disproportionately black, uh, black people, and from the statistics we've seen, it's young black men that tend to be stopped and searched and captured in this. Um, and because of the, the feeling that we anecdotally hear that people have been targeted, um, and you've, you've said 25% are successful hits, that's, that's actually you know, significant, and I think that's, that's good, and there is a reason for doing it. But that still leaves 75% of people, and given the numbers and the, 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 the demographics of people that are uh, searched, obviously it leaves a lot of room for people to feel like they are being targeted. So while I completely sympathize with your position that you find yourself in and the lack of a, an alternative tool, I was actually quite amused when you said service users. So the people, the people that have been stopped and searched by you, um, it would be really, really useful to hear a little bit more about, um, about how those stops and searches come about, please. Thank you. Yes, sure. So, so stop and search is, is governed by several pieces of legislation, but they all effectively say the same thing, which is an officer uh, has a power to undertake a stop and search if they have suspicion that somebody is carrying something that they shouldn't be carrying, whether that be drugs, whether that be weapons, whether that be um, uh, uh, items used to go and break into places. The way that it occurs is, is that officers uh, will, will use their suspicion in order to undertake the search. So one of the things that, that happens is, you know, how, however that suspicion is gained, whether it be through the observation of somebody, uh, through the, the um, uh, information intelligence that they, they have th through people telling them that something has occurred. So if I give you a, a, a an example of the last stop and search I was involved in, and um, I was walking uh, walking down Plumstead High Street by the fire station, and um, I got approached by a male. I was in uniform who said the man in the in the book is over there has got a knife in his down the back of his trousers. So when he came out of the the bookmakers, uh, uh, you, know, you under I undertook um, so I that's probably a little bit. Uh, royal of me, uh, a couple of my officers uh, who turned up undertook a stop, uh, you know, undertook a, a search that we didn't find a knife. We did, however, find drugs on him, so it would go down as a positive, uh, a positive stop and search. Every officer that undertakes a stop and search has to provide the grounds that the, what, uh, as to why they're searching. They then have to provide the object that they're searching for. Uh, and then there's uh, a, a series of other uh, pieces of key information that they need to provide, i.e. You know, what their warrant number is, where they're stationed, entitlement to, to um, uh, a copy of the stop and search form. Officers then, when they come uh, finish the stop and search, have to send, have to write up all of the reasons as to why that stop and search has been done, what the grounds are, where the suspicions come from and that then gets supervised by a supervisor. Um, so the, 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 where, the reason that a search could take place is, is almost infinite. <laughs> um, what form of words do you use when you're going to start a stop and search? Um, that's a good question, and uh, there, there is no set form of words. So there's a, an acronym that's required, which is called Go Wisely, where, they, like I say, they have to go through the grounds, the object, um, uh, yeah, the warrant, uh, entitlement to a copy. The, the, and this is where the difference comes between those people that have got experience and the skill of doing this uh, and those that have got less experience. Those that have got less experience 
um, come across quite robotic in their approach, whereas those that have got more experience and more skill will do that in a more of a conversational approach. Uh, one of the challenges that we have at the moment is just the sheer volume of people that I've got working uh, on the streets with less than two years service. Um, and the stop and search by its very nature, it can be quite confrontational. Uh, Officers, yeah. Yeah, it would, it would be, it would be something, I mean, so, so, um, excuse me, sir, ma'am, um, I'd like to, uh, you know, just talk to you. I need to um, detain you for the purposes of a search. The reason that I'm searching you is X, Y, or Z. Um, what I'm actually looking for is this. This is how the search is going to take place. This is who I am. You know, so you can put it into a conversation, but it also can be quite robotic. Mr. Chair, I think, I think that, was, that was a brilliant question because actually the, the approach and, and seeing uh, a man or woman in uniform approaching you uh, saying, I know you used the word detain, but obviously you'd want to use it more uh, conversationally, is that you know, a man or woman in uniform coming up to someone who may or may not be just going around minding their own business, hearing that language, shields go up, I guess diffusing a situation or, or not allowing a situation to get escalated and that you know is, is a very important part of that and the language obviously plays a significant role in that so I think that was a great question. Um, can I just probe a little bit deeper on the point that you made around suspicion uh, and how that is communicated to the person that you're uh, prof your service user, how, how that is performed on them, because um, you, you said that the, the officer conducting the search has to record it with their warrant number and where they're based. I, compl I completely accept all that, um, but when, you know, when you're recording data and you're recording reasons, the level of detail is important, and um, you know, you, you, it, it's very easy to say suspected carrying a knife or suspected, uh, suspected carrying drugs. Um, I, I really want to know the, the level of scrutiny and the, the, the detail that you, grow in, that you go into. Is it literally just that or does it have to be informed by intelligence or a tip like the example you gave? Uh, it can't just be someone going around and saying, I suspected because I suspect lots of things. Um, but then again, I grew up in the 90s watching the X-Files. Yeah, sure. So, so, so you, you have, they have to record the grounds. So where have they got their suspicion and how have they formed their suspicion? Uh, sometimes that's really clear cut. My example, somebody tells me they've seen a man go into a bookmaker's and they've seen that he's got a knife down, you know, down the back. You know, that's, that's the level of suspicion. That's where I've got my grounds from. I've got his, I've got his details. Um, the, 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 again, this comes to where the experience level comes from. So the greater the experience, the easier it is to be able to actually articulate and record what your, your grounds are. Um, and what you find is, is that you find um, supervisors, when they supervise it, will pull out, and one of their jobs is to actually check the grounds then check the body worn and check that the body worn matches the, the grounds. And, and that's where the immediate sort of feedback then comes in to say, you know, in this, in this situation, yes, you're, you're lawful, but you need, to in, you need to actually improve and record more of what your grounds are. Most officers can talk you through their grounds, their, their ability to sort of write it down and sort of articulate it in a very short and sharp punch is a little bit more challenged. Thank you very much. I'm honestly not trying to trip, any, trip anyone up or catch anyone. Um, and it, it, it's, it's, I appreciate myself as a, uh, a white, middle-aged man pushing 40s, probably not the best messenger of this message, but it is an important issue. And the perception uh, in a borough uh, like Greenwich, a very diverse borough like Greenwich, and the statistics you've shown us makes it very important. Um, so, so you've talked about the suspicion, you've talked about the process and the approach, thank you to uh, Councillor May. My final two points are, how is that, how is the result and the follow-up communicated to uh, the person that has been through it? Um, 
so you're doing what you can to stop, you know, to, to, to where it's turned up negative. Obviously, the person doesn't feel like they've been unfairly targeted. Um, I assume if they are, if it is a positive, then obviously it's a different kettle of fish. Um, and my, my, my final follow-up question is uh, what, uh, what uh, level and what actions are you taking to counter uh, the perception that the Met Police is going around and unfairly searching young black men? That's, that's not an assertion by me. I'm saying that that is, that I, is it, what... It, it's, it's well known. I don't, you know, I, 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 wouldn't, um, I wouldn't challenge that at all. Um, so in terms of how you leave the stop and search, again, that comes down, I mean, the 6,000 search encounters, you can imagine how you know, each officer will do that differently. Um, so, um, of course, if it's a positive, if there's a positive outcome, that normally leads to an arrest, so that's quite clear. Um, if not, it's, it's a case of, you know, we haven't found anything, thank you very much, you're, you know, you can, on your way. Um, it, it really comes down to the last part when you don't find anything isn't the part that, um, that leaves, that, that is the make or break of the encounter. It's the first part of the encounter where you're actually explaining to somebody why you've stopped them and what it is you want to do, and, the how, and then how you deal with them the way, all the way through the encounter. So it's almost, in many ways, that the last part, if it's a you know, no further action, isn't really the, the part that, you know, when I look at stop and search, that I worry about. I worry about the first part. How are we actually stopping the person? How are we explaining them to why we're doing it? How are we actually talking to them? Are we treating them with respect? Are we understanding where we're doing it? Um, you know, all of those sorts of things are the things that, that are important. And then on the final part, um, so there's a, a couple of things I, I would say. So um, we are just uh, at the moment um, launching uh, some uh, consultation work with the public around a stop and search charter, which will be co-written with the public about how we, we undertake stop and search and what that means to people. Um, I've also, um, uh, through my performance group, we now look at those people that have been stopped and searched with a, with a negative um, result on more than two occasions. Um, because, I, you know, I, I, I follow the, if we've stopped and searched somebody twice in, in a year and they haven't been found with anything, the chances are if we stop them third, fourth and fifth time, we may not find anything either. Um, and then I, the final thing I would say, which is the piece uh, that I sort of alluded to at, at the beginning, a lot of the feeling, and when I talk to, 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 to young black males uh, predominantly around stop and search, it, gets, it's, it also does get wrapped up into, I was stopped because I was driving, and that perpetuates this feeling that we are targeting more people and unfortunately there is no way of working out at the moment whether or not that is the case. Having, uh, I wrote a national report on stop and search for, um, for the Home Secretary several years ago on this specific issue and I would, I would if, if I was a betting man I would bet my house on the fact that people are stopped and searched more regularly if you're black driving than you are if you're white. Um, just on the amount of anecdotal evidence that, that sits there. And I think that's an area that we need to, we need to really think about how we do that. Thank you. Did you want to ask a question? So I know you're leaving early, aren't you, Sam? Okay. Olo. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, can I thank you for stepping in, Trevor? Um, we, in this panel, and the Royal Borough of Greenwich, we want to work with you to restore, and I'm going to use that word carefully, restore confidence within the Royal Borough of Greenwich. And we're not going to work for you, but we will work with you to do that. But before I ask any question, I'm going to go to the chair I sent that email, and I know most of you members have seen the email regarding, can we ask 
question regarding case J. You understand what I mean, yeah? Case J, I don't want to mention the name. Can we ask question? Because I did ask if the legal department can tell us the reason why we can't ask question about case J. Um, I would say no, Olu, because they came back and said, obviously it's an ongoing case, so it, it wouldn't be appropriate. Okay, that's fine. And I just want to put it on record that if we, in this borough, cannot ask questions about that, and it happens within this borough, which scrutiny panel is going to ask that question? I'll leave it there, Chair. Um, I was told. But I didn't could, hear any yeah. legal reason why we cannot. I was told that we would have somebody from the legal department here. I take it there's nobody here. Is anybody here, here from the legal department? Because I, I remember I sent the email to they you. They said that they would be here, didn't they? they I remember I sent the email that. to you. If you can tell us where the legal department said we cannot ask questions. No, they said it would. would I, it, yeah. I will listen to you, and I'm not going to ask any question about that. So I'll stop there at the moment. Um, Trevor, um, thank you very much for your presentation, and you've answered some of the questions that I wanted to ask. So I'm going to reduce my questions, and I'm going to ask one at a time. Time permitting, the chair will say you can ask another question. So I believe our stop and search is intelligent-led. So uh, I just want to look at it, and you mentioned it that, uh, you know, when we look at the population, it will seem, okay, we are searching so, so many people, but when we look at the black community, for example, in Thamesmead or Woolwich, compared with Westminster, the ratio is different. So if you, if you search 10 people in Thamesmead and none of them are black or seven of them is different from another area of the, 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 the country or London. So my question, my first question is, if we are searching people based on the intelligence, how come our positive rate is only 28%? Because to me, I would expect oh, maybe 70 positive, but we are 28. We are not even halfway. How intelligent are we? That's the first question. I'll stop there, Chair. Thanks, Olu. Yeah, sure, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a good question, uh, and positive outcome rates have, have been rising you know, over, over time, but you're, you're working on the basis of a suspicion, and suspicion is, is actually quite a low bar to be, to be looking at. So whilst if, if you... So in, in policing and in legal terms, there's two effective tests. Uh, the first is suspicion, and the second is belief. Um, so all the time you're working on, and the requirement is suspicion, so I suspect, and, and much like Councillor Lloyd over there, you can suspect an awful lot. Um, you can believe a lot less. So it is a lower test and a lower bar. In terms of the intelligence-led piece, it's, it's an intelligence led in terms of intelligence to form your suspicion. Um, now, I only need to suspect that you've committed a crime to arrest you. I don't need, you know, the, the legal test in this country is suspicion, which is why the, the number of people that get arrested and then the number of people, I mean, there's numerous reasons why they don't then follow through and get charged. But again, if you actually look at the number of people that get arrested to the number of people that get charged, if it was at 30%, I'd be really happy because we're, we're, we're a lot less than that. Um, so I think, um, I'm not sure, I, I can certainly see where you would like to go if you were to get to the stage where you were saying, because the opposite is if you were to raise it to belief, you drastically reduce the number of searches that you are doing, you may improve your outcome rate but you also might lose an awful lot of people that you would have taken knives and, and, and guns and things like that off 
um, because you're not operating at the, the level of suspicion. So there is a very tight balance to be had. And of course, we're not the arbiters of where that balance is. That's a legislative uh, decision. So the government are the arbiters as to where, or the legislative is, is the arbiters of where they wish to put that level. Now, if we go back to uh, the times of Theresa May as Home Secretary, she introduced uh, a higher bar and, and said, whilst you had to suspect that, you would, you, that somebody had got something on and suspect you'd find it, she introduced a new piece that said you had to suspect that somebody had got something and believe that you would find it on there. That was, again, that was withdrawn as a result of the number of stop searches dramatically reducing and the, and, the, and the level of violence and the type of violence, i.e. knife crime, peaking. So it's a real balance that, that the legislator works along, and we, of course, follow the, the, the legal framework that we're, um, we're, yeah, we're, we're provided with. Do you want to give others the chance, or you want me to ask another question? Yeah. Thank you. I have uh, two, two short questions, if I may, Chair. Thank you. Um, thank you for the update. The first is um, on supervision. So you've presented the demographic breakdown of stop and search, and you've explained how the use of stop and search is supervised. Um, could you just clarify, is that supervision done on an officer-by-officer -officer basis? And by that, I mean this chart that we've got here of what are the demographics of those search, which shows that most... Um, people searched uh, are from one group white. Um, is that data examined on an officer by officer basis? And so statistically, if there is an officer or a group of officers, a cohort of officers, that for which it's not the norm uh, over the, 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 the overall officers, that can then be investigated. Yeah, sure. So, so it, the the supervision is done by obviously the supervisors of, of the officers. Um, the, the supervisors would be able to pick up. There isn't a, a sort of a, I don't have a dashboard that, that says per this officer or per that officer. What, um, what we do, uh, what I do also run, which is, is unique to, to Southeast BCU, is I, I also run a, um, a, what's called a people intelligence board whereby I, I look at officers on an individual basis that flag up for a whole range of different things, whether or not it be use of force, whether it be complaints, stop and search, um, you know, high workloads. So, so we would also pick it up, up at that stage as to whether or not there was a disproportionate amount from an officer. What you tend to find is officers... Um, Officers that would be under be you know if officers were to come with that type of targeting of one particular racial group, they would flag up through their supervisor, or they would flag up through complaints. Thank you. So just as a follow up, um, can I ask why there isn't a dashboard? I mean, for the the stop and search outcomes slide says we've got six thousand six hundred and twenty four stop uh, searches. That's right, isn't it in Greenwich? So that's more than enough for a statistical analysis per officer. You know, if it was a handful, it would be wrong to draw conclusions on individual officers. Um, but it's more than enough statistically, I would think, to have a list of officers, a demographic um, breakdown of their searches, and you would very easily, quickly, in one glance, be able to see um, if any officer is way out of the norm in terms of the uh, uh, ethnic groups of the people that they are choosing to exercise that, that um, suspicion around and, and search. So um, do other, are there no dashboards in any BCUs? Um, and you know, could you perhaps take that away and consider, should we have a dashboard? Yeah, sure. I mean, I'll, I'll take it away. I mean, I've got 1,800 officers you know, that, um, that are conducting this type of work so across, maybe across several glances rather than so, one glance. I correct yeah. my question here. Yeah. yeah. If you could take that away, I think that would, perhaps that's something we could follow up on at a later date. It feels to me like um, I, I, I'm, I have a level of assurance of, from what you've said, reassurance that there is adequate supervision. That's one of the questions we asked. So don't take this as um, doubting the supervision that is in place. 
it would feel like an easy way of adding, triangulating that supervision to have a dashboard and to use um, statistics, uh, a statistical approach to checking for outliers. That was, that was my first question. And the, the second one is, is more kind of micro. In terms of the experience of somebody who is searched, you said um, you were more sort of uh, concerned with what happens at the outset of that interaction than the end, and I understand that uh, point well made. Um, but if somebody is searched, and as uh, Councillor Babatola said, the vast majority don't find uh, a a anything. Um, in that, exp in that um, case, somebody's been searched, and if they feel that they have been unfairly targeted, what could you just describe to us the experience? What is the option that they have to complain at that point? How does that actually work in practice? Yeah, sure. So, so one of the one of the aspects of the stop and search and the go wisely is that they're provided with the in, their entitlement, and that also includes the ability to to make a complaint and how to make a complaint. Um, the the difficulty you the difficulty that you have is that if you think about the people that we stop and search, they're going to be young people. Um, the concept and the idea of making a complaint against the police is quite a you know, it's quite a high bar, I would imagine, you know, to, to, to get over. And a lot of people just want to get away from, from us. They certainly don't want to be coming back into a police station at a later stage. So I think, which is why I'm, the, the real um, scrutiny that needs to go around is, is, is making sure that people, the encounter is the right encounter at the, at the right time. So you set it up very well at the beginning so that people don't feel as though they need to do that. Because, you know, certainly in, in my 27 years of policing, you see things that you think, I'd have made a complaint if that was me, and people don't. You know, so I wouldn't take any particular heart in, it, it's, you know, in, in that. So we, can, we make it as, as easy as possible, we explain things, but I'm not naive to the fact that people won't necessarily come and make a complaint to us. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I, 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 I've been trying to be fair and consistent by asking one question at a time, but I see my colleagues now are asking supplementary questions. So this one might be more than one question. First thing is that, why we all run away, and this is the way I appreciate the police, we run away from danger, and you run into it. We appreciate that, but there are some elements, and I believe you will admit, or you will agree with me, no, don't admit, that there are some bad elements who overdo stop and search. How do you recognize that? And mostly, in most cases, there'll be something wrong with the camera. And is it that they didn't turn it on, or they are on break, they were called eagerly, and they have to attend, or there is something. How do you follow that? Following on what uh, 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 Councillor Mahashley have just said, so when we get it wrong, what are the procedure? How do you speak to that person? What do you do to redress our failure? Say, for example, you, you stop me and you got it wrong. So what do you do to me? Yeah, I mean, that, that depends on how the officer's going to interact with you. I mean, if I stopped you and you'd got nothing on you, I'd you know, thank you for your time and, you know, and, and make sure that, you know, as, as far as possible that, you know, I, I've calmed the situation uh, down. Th there is no, um, there's no sort of civil redress um, or no sort of recompense uh, for that because, like I say, the, the purpose of stop and search is to, in order to stop people being arrested. So for every single stop and search that we conduct, because the grounds are there, the suspicion is there, at that stage, the officer could go directly to arrest. 
So, like I say, when I, make, when I wrote the national reports on stop and search, one of, the, one of the, the, the things that I did pose to the Home Secretary was, you could quite easily do away with stop and search, but what you would end up doing is, is actually you'd, you'd, um, you, you, you'd cause a greater trauma on people by arresting them. Because if you're going to arrest, you know, if I, a stop and search, most stop and search encounters are fairly quick in their nature. You're talking between five and 10 minutes. Most arrest encounters, by the time I've arrested you, I've put handcuffs on. If I, if I feel the need to put handcuffs on, I then get a, a van to take you to a police station. I then get to a police station. You're probably waiting at least half an hour to be booked in. You know, you know, and then you're, you're given your legal rights. You're probably likely to be detained for at least six hours, I would suggest, before um, before you'd be released. So that, so one of, so, which is why I flagged that at the beginning, one of the whole purposes of stop and search is, is, is to prevent that uh, greater intrusion into, the, you know, the straight state's intrusion into somebody's life is actually reduced. Um, it's not perfect, it's not perfect, but it does, it does stop, uh, you know, what I would, I, w I wouldn't ever want to get down to that stage where we're arresting people as opposed to search, you know, Giving them the giving innocent people the opportunity to say actually there's I haven't got anything on me right at that beginning. Teacher, can I ask another one question and that will be the last one. And if there's any other question that I've got here, I will send them to you and then the officer, I mean the police, can uh, uh, reply. How many incidents or how many officers have reported in Royal Borough Greenwich? that they don't use their camera? How many? If you can tell me the answer, fair enough. If you can't, you can send it to the panel. We want to know how many officers haven't used their, or turned their camera on when they are doing stop on search. And I will stop there and thank you all for coming. Yeah, sure. So um, 3.5% of stop and searches don't have body worn video. So, if we, t I'd, I'd have to look, um, you know, whether you know, for Greenwich, Lewisham, and, and, and Bexley, but it's, I, w I would, um, I would be fairly confident. Well, I'd be very confident that it's, it's, it's fairly equal. It'll be a random spread. So you're looking at whatever three, three and a half percent of six thousand is. My maths, unfortunately, isn't that good uh, at this time of the evening. But also just in relation to that, the sergeants generally tend to supervise the stop and searches for their officers. So say for example, me, me, and, me and the boss are searching somebody, for whatever reason my camera hasn't worked or I don't, don't have one, you can look at, you get a geographical location, you can see what cameras were recording at that specific time. So sometimes, you know, if there's a group of officers and none of them are recording, then obviously that does raise flags to the supervisor. And the supervisor will think, well, hang on, this is the second time I've supervised Joe Bloggs' search. His camera's not working. Or, you know, you then actually get the person to say, right, why aren't you using your camera? The next search, you will be using your camera. And then we have disciplinary measures because, obviously, we want to get it right. As an inspector, I quite often get complaints. Or when I was in the operations room, they'll be the first port to call. And for us, the, the easiest way to see what's actually happened is to watch the body-worn footage, because it's like anything. You get two stories, and generally the truth's somewhere in between. And just going back to the other point the boss made when you search youngsters, again, when I was in the operations room, quite often they go home and they'll tell mum or dad, I've just been searched, and it's mum or dad who would then phone us up and make the complaint. And we would quite often go through the body-worn footage on the phone, and either... And sometimes we, we agree, you, you, you know, if an officer hasn't followed the procedure or we don't think their grounds are sufficient, we then follow that up as well. Thank you, Chair. Thanks. Um, can I just ask a question? The MPS searches have gone down and by about 1%. Um, so would you think that more searches means more PORs and if so, does that mean that the stop and search is failing if it's, if it's not a deterrent? I, 
I think there's a, there's a balance to be had. Um, I I wouldn't say that there's any less of a deterrent. It's not got. It's got the the numbers aren't so low that you would go. There's no deterrent factor there. Um, you know, and, and certainly, you know, anecdotally, people will will say that they've been stopped and searched, so, and that's probably where you're going to get most of your deterrents from. Mm -hmm. So the idea that you may well be stopped and searched. Um, there's a balance to be had about the number of, you know, if you drive them down too low, then that causes a problem. So we have no targets around stop and search. Um, there's no targets at all, and we've got no aspirations to make it no, larger or no. greater. I think the, the piece um, that we, uh, you know, there are times very good reasons why you would want to potentially see more stop and search. So if I give you a, for instance, um, I had, not on this borough, but in, in Lewisham, a particular estate uh, whereby there'd been some tit-for-tat um, uh, violence, quite significant violence. Um, and I, um, I asked for a public meeting, uh, and I asked the, the, for, for basically for mums to turn up. That was my, my demographic, that's what I was after. Um, and it was really clear when the mums turned up and I asked them what they would like, they actually wanted more stop and search. So you do get times when more stop and search is what's wanted and sometimes you get occasions where less, less stop and search is wanted. Mm. It's, it's, it, really is a, it, it really is a tightrope to walk as to what is the right answer for what communities and at what time. Thanks, Trevor. Um, you wanted... Sure. Macy. Thank you very much. Um, you mentioned that you wanted to um, be scrutinised more by people who were experiencing stop, stop and searches, um, which seems a good idea. What would you hope to gain from that kind of engagement? What would you be looking for? I think it's, it's twofold, really. So first, um, it's the sort of lived experience that you, you know, somebody can actually provide you, so they can actually say, do you know what, when you say it in this, when you do something in this way, you, this is how it affects us. Um, so that's one way. And the second way is, it's, it's the ability for people that have been stopped and searched to be able to provide feedback that you can then go and use in a, in a, in a more constructive way. So what we find, or what I find sometimes with the people that come and um, you know, sit on sort of stop and search monitoring groups and uh, and such is they get used to our way of you know it's, I'll, I'll choose my words carefully but I always worry that what happens is is that the longer you work with the police the more you become used to our ways of working and actually you know, we spend a lot of time explaining our ways of working and therefore we don't get a different voice. And I think if we were to get more people that had experienced it, you'd get a different voice in the room. Thank you very much. Do you want to continue the presentation? Thank you. So the next bit is going over the performance of the Woolwich Town Centre team. So the Woolwich Town Centre team been, has been around for 18 months. So since they, they've been in, they've co co uh, conducted 1,200 stop and searches, and that's with a 32% positive outcome rate. So that's you know, a few, quite a few percent above, above the actual average, and that's with over 200 arrests. Uh, obviously, so just to remind you that we don't always arrest people. Um, they, might get, um, they might get a warning of some description, or they might get reported for, for summons, say, for example. So we know who they are. Um, it's not the most serious offence in the world. We've got all the evidence we want. So we'll say, well, you go away. We'll invite you in for an interview at a later date, which is why, obviously, it's 200, way, way below 32%. Um, the footprint is essentially Woolwich Arsenal, so it's not just the town centre. And you can see from the slide, there's a, a big variety in things they found from drugs, firearms, knives, stolen property. And obviously that's led to a number of convictions at court. And we're also working very closely with the business crime reduction group that started about, I think it's about five months ago now. And that's obviously looking at retail crime. 
Um, they've also executed a number of warrants, and that's around drugs and frauds. So they would look at residential properties as well as commercial properties. Some of the commercial properties have been involved in drug dealing is, as well as fraud would close along those sorts of things as well. Obviously, we work very closely with, with yourselves, um, with the community safety officers. Um, they, they help to reinforce force them because obviously those officers need, need a bit of backup because we have far more powers. As I'm sure, sure you're aware, you, you know, your officers do a great job and they do go and deal with people in confrontational situations. Let's go on to the next slide. Um, and on that note, we also assist assist in targeting the breaches of the public space protection orders, um, which, which, you know, is a really good bit of legislation. We are looking to move forward so that we can enforce them as well. Quite often we're there in the background because at the moment the, your, your officers enforce them, but they might not necessarily have the powers to, to tell people. They've got to provide their names and addresses, and we have greater powers, say, to confirm their identity and those sorts of things. So people can't get away with, with lying and essentially getting away with the offences. Um, obviously, the team are confident with uh, issuing ASB warning forms for first-time offenders. That's antisocial behaviour warning forms. Sorry, I'm just catching up. And um, also CBNs. So CBNs is essentially someone's regularly um, committing antisocial behaviour. We can essentially give them conditions about they need to moderate their behaviour. And then if they breach that, we then go to court to for the next stage and if they breach that they can be arrested so if you start if you see the same individuals causing problems those are sort of an our toolbox to to deal with that any questions around the Woolwich Town Centre team uh, you see, it's, it's just a, slightly more about the principle of that last point that you made there about the the, the issuing of the uh, the 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 Community protection notices and Thank orders. Thank you. To get people to uh, curtail their behaviour. It, it just seems... Obviously, they're not doing something that is uh, a, a criminal matter that gets them arrested, but it is something that is significant enough that you would issue a civil notice against someone. And then the, the, the civil notice obviously has the backing of the courts, and then following that is arrest. It, it just... It just seems like a given the, given the way our justice system is constructed um it, it, it just it just seems like a, a strange process to go through I, I, and i understand maybe why you have to but to go from a civil matter to the criminal and and it's so i'm just thinking out loud sorry chair it's, it's well, just <laughs> quite often it's low level offenses so it might be things like beggars um street drinkers or, or you've got someone who's just been, been loud or maybe a little bit abusive. So, yes, they might just reach a threshold for a public order offence, but generally the, the threshold might be so low to the point someone turn around and say it's not in the public interest to prosecute. But when they start breaching these, we look at, well, actually, it's, it's not one occasion. They're out there three, four times a week doing the same thing. It seems you knew what I meant better than I did there, actually. Um, I, was, I, was, I was on a journey. I just didn't quite arrive. Any other questions? So just, I mean, obviously, the town centre team is pretty much what it says on the can. It just covers the town centre. We've also got the Greenwich um, Integrated Enforcement Team, and they will work all over the borough. Prior to the Woolwich Town Centre team coming into force, they did spend most of their time in Woolwich Town Centre, but, but obviously that now frees them up quite a bit. So it's only a small team, it's, it's one, one sergeant for PCs, but they are extremely productive. Um, so since August 2022 um, to August 2023, they conducted over 242 stop and searches with over 50 arrests. Um, the, they're very effective at information sharing between the, the council. Um, and they don't just look at targeting what's on the street. Say, for example, the council needs help with eviction notices or evicting people or anything along those lines. They've all got each other's phone numbers and they go around and help with that or whether it's um, helping out the council with their warrants because they have a number of warrants which, which they execute as well. 
So they also have their, their own days of action. Um, and they were, again, working in partnership with the, with the Greenwich tasking team, which is another body of officers, and the town centre team, and generally work in tandem as well with the enforcement officers. So if there's a, a problem, say, for example, like there was a problem with uh, drug dealing in the Parry Street, I can't remember the name of the shop, I think it's Divine Cakes, um, who didn't actually sell any cakes. But, so they went in, executed the warrant, and they're not just interested in the short term, you know, what have we got in front of us? They're actually then followed up with closure orders and work with the council to do that. So the next day, they can't be dealing drugs again because we've, we've closed down that premises and link them with the landlord and say, tell them what's going on and suggest obviously the premises is used for something a, a bit more positive. The team also became finalists in last year's excellence awards for the Safe and Neighbourhood team, and that's for the whole Met and they'd won it the previous year. And when we did the research around that, one of their, their best statistics is from a, whenever they arrest somebody, the positive outcome rate after they've arrested them was about 92%, which is extremely high. Um, and obviously that positive outcome could, is not just necessarily charged and go to court. Um, it could be a, a caution or a number of other, other outcomes, but it does show to me that they are very good at targeting the right people believe that oh, it's another slide as well um, and that just goes on to reinforce what I've already said and that they do work very closely with the safer spaces team um, and their local knowledge is 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 very good they know all the local uh, you know the local drunk say for example the local drug dealers they they know them exceptionally well and and obviously they they will target them I haven't actually got their figures to hand, but again, their, their positive outcome rate for stop searches is, is well above the Met average as well. And as you can see there, um, they've even managed to, uh, to identify some, a murder suspect and uh, actually affect the arrest, which led, led them to get in a lifetime prison sentence. And, and again, because they deal with the same people, um, when they know they're wanted, um, whether they haven't turned up at court um, or there's an inquiry where they're wanted because they know them, know, they know their hangouts, they're very quick at actually go, going and arresting them as well. So bring them to justice a lot faster. Any questions? Sorry. Um, congratula congratulations to the team on being the finalists. I thought that was, um, was there anything that the, the winners did that you thought was like, kind of good or best practice that you would like kind of like to use that of, of that I'm, not, I'm going to be biased of course um, because they're my team um, but the winners did close down the drugs line but their write-up was actually for the whole of their safer neighborhoods team so when you actually looked at it, the ratio and again being biased I think because they'd won it the previous year they gave it to somebody else this time around <laughs> fingers crossed Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, I just want to ask how you interact with, with people that they've got a problem. It's not because, um, it's, it's, it's not because of those who have got mental issues or family breakdown and they just went out there at the Garden, Garden Square and, you know, time is behaving. How do you engage, how do you uh, signpost them to the right channel? Because this person, uh, looking at your record when you made the phone call, he hasn't got anything before. But all of a sudden, you've got this. What are the root causes? How do you signpost them to the right channel? I mean, it obviously all depends what they're doing, because if we go in and meet somebody who's doing something very low level and they're engaging with the officers, um, you, you know, they will talk to them. We have what we call, a ref we've got the computer system which li links in with the council so that we can refer people to, say, adult social services or, or the, the youth side of things, depending on what's, what's appropriate. There's also various drug advisory groups and a number of different charities around the borough. So we do link in with them. I mean, what I mentioned about the, the, the orders earlier, we don't go straight to those. It's somebody has to have a pattern of behavior before, before we get to that stage. 
So we do try and give people the benefit of the doubt because we're all human. We, we all have bad days. So, so you, you know, we do get that as well. Thank you, Adrian. The next slide. Yeah, sure. No, that's fine. I, and I'll probably do the, the, the four slides that, that come after this all, all in, in one piece. Um, how, how do we interpret the, the Casey report, uh, and specifically in regards to Greenwich, is a really good question. Um, the, the Casey report was extremely difficult reading for anybody, but I think probably more difficult from, from, from a policing perspective, being able to you know, read through that. The, the really interesting thing about the Casey report is that everything that was in there was actually provided by police officers to Dame Louise Casey. Uh, and she sat in my office and, and spoke to several of my officers, you know, and, and they explained um, you know, what some of the difficulties are and, and where some of the issues have been. And it's resulted in, um, obviously, in a, in a new commissioner. Uh, I think the commissioner has been uh, very clear around you know, his stance of what is and is an acceptable uh, and the new Met for London uh, plan, uh, which talks about um, more, um, more trust, uh, less crime and, and high standards. But it also talks quite a bit, and if you speak, if you listen to to the commissioner at any of the sort of New Met for London um, events, um, he talks very much about fixing the foundations uh, and the way in which we've probably come away from um, local policing and the investment into local policing and, and the desire to want to put a new lens across how we deal with uh, our, our task at hand, and that being doing the right thing for, for victims and communities. Uh, and I think, um, you know, over a series of a, a number of years, we have responded to, you know, financial challenges, budget cuts, uh, and, and that's not to make excuses, but what it's, what it's done is, is it's, it's caused us to do things that's in the interest of us. It's caused us to do things that's, you know, it's easier for us to do it this way than it is to do it that way, because actually that's the, 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 the right way of doing it. So one of the things that the Commissioner has been very clear about as, as BCU commanders is providing a lot more autonomy about how we want to set up our our policing, how we, we, we set up our policing stance and how we're going to engage with, with local communities and, and, and what that looks like. And the, the slides that Sally has put there, she's actually done a, an action plan specifically for Greenwich. Um, and I, you know, I don't want to go through all of those actions. We could be here all evening. Um, but I think that the thing that I would take away from it is there's, there is a clear desire to want to put more resource back into into neighborhood policing there's a clear desire to want to work a lot closer with communities uh, and there's a clear desire to be a lot more transparent around the way in which we interact and when we've done things that we shouldn't have done you know for whatever reason um that be, you know that's actually called out so um i'm i'm actually quite positive about Casey in many respects because I think it will I think there's seminal moments in policing you know and you know I, like I say I, I look back I, you know I'm coming towards the end of my career and I look back at, at my career and, and there have been things that have adversity and and, and 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 has created this impetus to do things differently um, and I think the thing that we need to seize upon is is how do we do it differently um, how do we work together to, to do that, and how do we actually make sure that the policing that we we deliver is the right policing, um, you know, a, a, and it targets the right areas. Um, so, so I'm 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 fairly positive around it. Um, we'll talk about recruitment in a minute, and I'm I'm I say fairly positive around it. Recruitment is a challenge, uh, you know, and, and I'll talk about recruitment in a minute. So we're going to have some challenges in actually hitting our aspirations. So for instance, 
one of the um, one of the areas which I think is is probably one of the best things that I've seen is the is, is a significant uplift in the number of of PCSOs. Um, now it's 500 this year, but we already know that we're actually struggling to recruit those, uh, and we're probably about 300, so we're 200 short of where we would like to be. Um, and they make, for me, they make a massive difference in communities because they're the people that are actually there all the time, uh, speaking to their communities, listening to their communities, and being able to feed back on their communities. So. I, I don't underestimate the challenge. Um, there's a lot of internal challenge uh, around uh, around this. Um, you know, the commission has been really, uh, really strong on on the sort of standards issue and, and, and where that sits. Um, but it's also been, and I think we have to 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 reflect on. You know, I come into work every day and I see amazing people doing amazing things. You know, each and every day, and 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 you know sometimes in some really difficult and dreadful circumstances so we you know, we can't underestimate that but we also have to uh, you know we also have to acknowledge that there's also people in the organization that quite clearly shouldn't be in the organization thank you chair uh, thank you for that update yes there are amazing people doing amazing things and we all we all know that and um in our wards, uh, we all work with outstanding officers uh, who, who, who fit that category. It's their work as much as anybody else that's undermined by the poor standards of others in the organization. And you'll know that in July, um, we passed, uh, Greenwich Council has passed a unanimous motion um, uh, on uh, calling on the Met Police to implement the KC report recommendations in full. It's quite difficult to get 52 local councillors to agree on anything um, from two political parties, but this is something that passed unanimously. Um, and one element of that, which uh, lots of us feel very strongly about, is um, uh, was criticism of the uh, Met Police Commissioner's refusal so far to accept the finding that the Met Police is institutionally racist, sexist, homophobic, and misogynistic. and. Um, the motion um, notes, and many of us noted in that debate, that that refusal is undermining the good work that we've seen summarized in this report uh, on the new uh, Met for London plan. So I'm obviously not putting you in the position of, of uh, asking you to comment on the boss's um, decision on that. But if I could ask, Chair, if I may, um, if we could just leave you um, in no doubt about our feelings uh, as uh, the Royal Borough of Greenwich and the people we represent um, on that particular decision uh, from the commissioner not to make that, accept that finding. And, and if you have an opportunity to relay our strong feelings on that directly to the commissioner as we have and the cabinet member has and the leader of the council has after that motion, we would be, uh, I think, very grateful. Yeah, if I, if I could just respond on that. So um, clearly the, the commissioner has, has positioned himself as, as to where he stands on that. Um, to, to reassure you, um, I don't think, well, certainly the, the events that I've seen him, I, I don't think I've been at an event yet where somebody hasn't mentioned it. Um, and I've certainly spoken to him about the, the difficulty that it, you know, of, of being able to, it's a very nuanced argument to say you accept all of the recommendations, but you don't accept that piece. And, and I, I do understand where he comes from, but it does, you know, locally it, it causes you know, difficulties. Um, suffice to say, we, rec yeah, we, we accept all of the recommendations. In, in many respects, I can't make the decision for him. All I can say is locally, we'll do everything we possibly can. Thank you. Uh, that's under, understandable, and um, you'll appreciate why we needed to put that on the record and, and make sure that was heard loud and clear. And thank you for passing it on. Um, so that leads into my second and last question, which is, um, how would you say that your officers are responding to the new Met for London plan, the acceptance of the Casey report's recommendations? You know, are people, are officers, uh, coming along with the journey with the Met Police hierarchy on this. Um, is it impacting morale, which I can understand? The answer is probably yes. And could you just comment on how, how you're engaging your people 
um, to, to bring them along with that really important reform that's so badly needed. Yeah, sure. So um, let, me, let me deal with morale first, if I may. Um, every year that I've been in policing, policing have said morale's low. Um, uh, you know, but I would say, you know, I've got, there's no statistics around morale. You can't fall on a data set that, that proves morale is, is higher or lower. Officers are, uh, I would say that there is, uh, yeah, there is um, you know, challenges in that area. Uh, and you, you, know, you can understand why, because if you are a, you know, as, we, as we've both recognised, if you're one of those outstanding officers, it, it becomes quite demoralising when you're looking around and, and, and all of the headlines that you're reading is something opposite to the work that, that you're doing. Um, but what I would say is, you know, those officers do want to make a difference, so they do get the, the desire for the, the, yeah, the, for the plan and, and how it's working. Um, we hold, uh, we've ha held internal engagement events with our officers. We've explained what the, the plan is. It's quite difficult because aspects, of, certain aspects of the plan aren't delivered locally. So they're, you know, fixing the foundations, for instance, you know, finding new police stations. That's not something that, that my cops are going to go and do. That's something that will be done, um, be done sort of more centrally. Um, I think the, the, the aspect for me is, is, is getting back to the, um, I, I sent out a message um, probably three or four weeks ago now, perhaps a little bit more, which is, you know, just because you can doesn't mean you should. And it's trying to sort of change the stance in, yes, we get, you know, policing, the minute you become a police officer, you get some fairly um, large powers. Um, that doesn't mean you need to use them. So it, it, some of it is, a, is, 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 is so much more nuanced than having an action plan that says, oh, we'll do this or we'll do that. A lot of it is about how you actually set a policing stance and how you, you decide that you're going to interact with people and you, you're going to work. Um, and, and police officers get that. They absolutely get that piece. One follow-up, if I may, Chair. Um, would you, are there officers in Greenwich who, would you say, don't accept the findings of the KC review? Um, it'd be really hard to say because, uh, you know, without, without uh, two things I would say. If I asked them whether they accept the findings, of course they're going to say yes, because that's the answer. Um, so that would be the first thing. And, and the second thing is, I've, you know, I've not spoken to every single officer on individual level. What I would say, which is my opening point, is everything that's in um, Dame Louise's report came from police officers. So I don't think it's going to be a case that people don't. And, and, and the, the, when, when the report uh, was first published, what was really clear from officers w was this sense of, we've been telling you this for some years. You know, this isn't new. We knew that, you know, we've, we've known this. So I don't think officers are saying, oh, no, this isn't, this isn't representative of, of us. Um, I wouldn't, you know, I, I'd be fairly confident about that. And also on that note, you know, the vast majority of officers come to work because they want to be police officers and make a difference. And, you, you know, we have our own mechanisms within. So if police officers see wrongdoing, obviously the, the traditional way is to go to the supervisor or their inspector, which, which does happen. And we've also got our own internal whistleblowing system so that people can report wrongdoing anonymously if they don't feel, feel they're able to. But I mean, I know my officers, they have come to me and reported wrongdoing and obviously with, you know, taking the appropriate action. So there is a degree of people want to police themselves because they don't like the, the rotten apples that spoil it for them because you know, with all the headlines, it, it makes their job so much more difficult. I can just move on to, to, to recruitment. So um, recruitment is a really challenging area at the moment. Um, it, it's been quite well documented that um, we're, we're about a thousand officers short. We were the only force in the country that didn't meet its uplift targets. Um, there's several reasons you know, why that's the case. London, you know, we work on a national pay system 
So I get paid the same amount of money as I would do if in, in Cumbria, and I'm, I'm fairly confident it would be cheaper to live in Cumbria than it would to, to live in London. Um, you know, so, 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 so that makes it a, a, a challenge. Um, there's obviously also the challenge, Casey you know, presents a challenge because you, know, you, you would ask people rightly, you know, why would you want to come and work for, for this organisation you know, at this current time? Um, you know, it wouldn't be an unfair question. So that, that is causing a problem. Uh, and it's certainly causing a problem for our desire to want to sort of make sure that the new Met for London gets off the, you know, gets off the ground. Uh, in terms of our sort of, um, our work around sort of un unrepresented groups and, and, and diversity, um, it, it, in many respects, it's really frustrating. Um, we have uh, one of, if not the best outreach team um, in the Met, in, uh, yeah, that operates on South East. They recruit some of the um, biggest numbers of people from diverse backgrounds. The problem is, is that whilst they recruit them here, most people don't want to work in the area that they live. So they tend to go and work somewhere else. So I don't see it, you know, come back around. Um, but, you know, that's not to say that, you know, um, I'm really proud of the, out the work the outreach team do here because ultimately, whilst they may not come and work, you know, work with myself and work with Adrian, they are going and working in another borough somewhere else, which ultimately will make a difference in, in that location. Um, it's still a challenge, um, you know, to get to get diversity uh, through, um, and, and of course that challenge gets greater the further you go up the ranks because of the time lag that it takes, you know, to get to, to, to positions like myself, you know, takes some time to, to get there. Um, they can, you know, what that leads to is it leads to decisions that I make on almost a daily basis as, a, as to where I, 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 I have my vacancies and where I don't. Um, you know, and uh, you know, that sometimes impacts on yourselves in terms of DWOs, dedicated ward officers, PCSOs, whether or not you've got one or not. Um, you know, they're the sorts of decisions that I have to make on a daily basis. And it's not a case that I'm making them as going, oh, I don't like a particular ward. It's a case that I'm, I'm having to juggle as to whether or not I answer 999 calls or whether or not we, we have that. And it, again, it's that sort of tightrope that, that you do in policing all the time. Um, having said that, um, we are, um, as of this month, we are fully staffed within our safer neighbourhoods, uh, dedicated ward officers and, and PCSOs. The challenge will be is actually where, where we want to get to in increasing those numbers. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for, for your presentation. I, I know you struggle for, for recruitment, and you just nail it on top of now that uh, some people, you recruit them, but they don't want to work in the area. And the reason is simple. They get double whammy from the community saying, oh, maybe he's a traitor. And that is why we need to to work with you, not for you, so that we can improve the confidence to reassure the community that, well, it's been in the past, but we are improving in terms of our engagement, you know, with the community. So I, I don't know, maybe your HR can do any promo to encourage to let uh, the, the ethnic minority know that, you know, we're not there yet, but we are improving. Because I do welcome one thing you said, or in this paper, that before the sergeant will determine stop on site, but now it's an inspector. It's not that we are underrating the sergeant, but it's giving more accountability that gives me more assurance that, you know, this person is making a decision. So if there's any way we could help, and I know every time we have events, you go there to promote, to recruit, which is a good thing, but we need to see a lot of uh, ethnic minority 
to be there on that day to say, look, come, I'm here, you know. Yeah? Thank you, Chair. Sorry, any other questions? No? Thank you very much. That was much appreciated. Hope you don't think, feel like you've had the spotlights on you all evening, but thank you very much indeed. Thank, no, thank you. It's um, something I'm used to. <laughs> and if you can take away those points about, you know, the um, dashboard and um, the Casey report. Yeah, can I just say on the, on the, just on the point of the dashboard, just to, to, to be really clear, if we do, if we can go down that route, it will only be internal. We would never publish it externally because of no. GDPR of course. reasons. I, but there Absolutely. was no, no suggestion that it would be public, yeah. And, and Chair, if, if, if you permit me, I just want to say when, while you are here that, and the cabinet lead, where is she? To she note, here. Yet, yet, to note this, if you can note that for, for her, I'm really disappointed because I asked a question about the legality of we not being able to ask questions today regarding the case, but I'm going to forward some questions to you that you can place past to yourself, and if you can answer me, because there are certain things you can't answer because of your rank or whatever, but if you can answer, please, I'll be very grateful. But I'm really disappointed with our legal department. Mm. Because I'm disappointed yeah, that they're the, not here. The message was sent more than two, three weeks ago, mm. and none of them are here, and they can't even drop me an email that we will discuss that mm. uh, further. So, sorry, I had enough. <laughs> Thank you, Olo. And uh, the other thing I was going to ask is, I know Sam Littlewood um, wanted to ask some questions, so would it be okay if we forwarded them on to you yourselves? Thank you very much indeed. You're welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting, but if you've got to go off. When you're ready, thank you. Right. Oh, good evening, everyone. Um, so I've got I've got Cheryl and Adrian with me. Um, I'll do an overview um, of the report, um, and then obviously we'll, we'll welcome any questions. Um, so this is the the third time I believe um, we're um, updating the panel um, or the scrutiny panel around the safer neighbourhood panels. Um, I think the last time we did this was back in October 2022. Um, and since then, um, although it's, it's been a work in progress in a way, um, a, trem a tremendous amount of work um, has been implemented um, by our police colleagues um, and Safe Neighbourhood Board um, Chair um, and Safe Neighbourhood Board Panel Chairs. Um, and the, the whole um, reason why we're presenting this um, was just, just to kind of give a, a, a brief history, um, and you've probably heard it before anyway, but um, this has come out from a review that was undertaken in 2020. Um, an in-depth re review was um, undertaken um, to look at the Safer Neighbourhood panel, panels at the time. Um, and lots of information was collated by our uh, police, um, Safe Neighbourhood Board Chair at the time. Um, and there were lots of meetings and surveys um, that were undertaken. Um, and this is to, to look at how the panels were performing and seeing how they could be further improved. Um, 
So from all those meetings and things, and um, a review and evaluation report um, was um, then presented and collated. Um, and that looked at various things, um, including panel attendance, effectiveness, representation and community engagement. Um, and that report highlighted several recommendations. Um, and the aim of the recommendations and, and the kind of report and the, um, the, is to um, ensure that the panels are, are working effectively, ensure that all the panels are representative, um, improving community engagement, um, and just improving the overall effectiveness of the board panels. Um, so there are eight recommendations. Um, I won't go through each one in depth, um, because I know that you've all seen the report anyway. Um, but the recommendations cover various topics, um, including um, a development of a timetable or action plan um, for um, implementing um, effectively, uh, effective operating panels, um, campaign um, or campaign to promote greater awareness of the work of the safe and neighbourhood panels, what they are, what they do, their functions, um, recruitment. Um, how they're advertised, um, how to draw in different groups of, of people, including hard-to-reach groups in the borough as well, um, engagement methods, um, partnership working, um, and um, that includes the attendance of, of all councillors at the ward panel meetings as well. Um, and also looking at um, physical aspects of the ward panels as well, so locations and times and, and what suits people the most really so looking at a wide range of things um, and and the, the the operation of of the panels and that's looking at the chair and, and vice chair and, and and that kind of thing and the structure of the meetings um, so a lot of work has gone into place there are a couple of um, recommendations where things are still in progress and ongoing um, but there have been um, numerous engagement activities for example um, lots of different methods and meetings and ways of um, getting out into the community and promoting the panels um, in loads of different ways. Um, a, even a video has been produced. Um, there's been lots of um, leafleting, flyers, um, safe neighbourhood um, uh, teams, um, engaging with communities. Um, a lot of work has been undertaken by the safe neighbourhood um, panel chairs as well. And there have been some changes since the last time we presented this as well because now we've taken into consideration the um, implementation of the new boundaries too. Um, so introduction of, of new um, panel chairs and, and ward councillors. So there's been a lot of work around that too. So that's, that's an overall summary. Um, I'll open it, shall I open it up to you Cheryl or Adrian to say a bit more? Okay. So I took on the role of chair um, December uh, 2022 um, and since then we have done a, um, working with the council and the police, we've done an event for ward panel chairs, um, we opened up some training opportunities We've also um, liked to how to run a meeting, how to advertise, because not everybody has those skills straight away. So we identified that, and because there's six more panels than when we um, started the review, is there's been a, a period of change. So we recognise that, and um, actually um, Mopac have agreed to give us some money to help additional training, additional support for the ward panels in, and really investing in the um, cohesion and the work of the panels and looking at um, helping with recruitment. And each panel has been awarded £250 uh, in addition to the other uh, funding that we've applied for this year. Um, and that is to help publicise uh, the panels and Greenwich Council has also helped produce um, some leaflets to hand out about what wall panels are. We've also, as um, I said, 
indicated, um, we've produced a small video to put across on social media as to why it's important to get involved with that conversation and to have an active role within their community. It's really important. We hear many times, oh, nothing gets done, nothing, you know, not in the panels, but, you know, through the community. And this is their real, um, their real opportunity to um, have a say about what matters to them in their wards. And for those councillors that do attend the ward panels, I would really encourage all ward panel, um, sorry, all ward councillors to, to attend the panels. Um, because what I've found, because I'm also a ward panel chair myself, um, is that people bring um, issues that are not to do with the policing of the community, but to do with um, the council's role in the community. And it's a great opportunity to have those conversations, maybe outside of the meeting over a cup of coffee and, and things like that, but at the venue at the time, but to be highlighted. And it's also your opportunity as, as councillors for those uh, residents that are not there that they've brought to you at their surgeries to bring that information. It's about information building. It's about working on problem solving approaches. So we're gonna be doing training to the um, ward panel chairs around problem solving approaches and working in partnership with the police, working in partnership with the council, looking at what resources are there and what resources do they need in order to help reduce fear of crime in the community, how they can increase membership, how they can um, prevent um, crime from happening in the community, working with those key individuals, key groups within the communities, such as neighbourhood watch groups, such as um, community groups that don't necessarily, um, and I, I, hear, I see them as unheard parts of the community. They're not being heard yet. And, Rather than um, rather than putting them in you know these different um, categories, I see it as un they're unheard in the community. We're all one community. It shouldn't be separate to, for me. Um, and it's really important that we give everybody within our community a voice. And I'll give you an example. We've got the and the great work that the police have been doing as well as us with regards to the Nepalese community. They're a very, very um, prominent community, especially within the Plumstead area and also the Woolwich area. And, you know, their fear and experiences of crime are very different to us. And we need to adapt. We need to look at how we can adapt to make sure that they're heard too. Um, and we work with them to do that. So with regards to the ward panels, I can, rest, I can reassure you that we are very invested. Um, we have a great um, opportunity. We've made sure that the Safe and Able Board is hybrid um, so that it gives opportunity to those that can't come physically to a meeting can actually engage um, from the comfort of their own home. You know, we've all got responsibilities. We've all got... Um, you know, different commitments that we all have. And we have to recognise um, we have one of our trustees, for instance, that is, um, that is disabled and he can't get out of his um, property at the moment to attend meetings. So by opening up that um, opportunity to have the hybrid meeting, it may make sure that he's not excluded and it's really important to us that we can explore every opportunity to make sure that people aren't excluded. And we've also opened up to the ward panel chairs if they want to use, we've got a paid for Zoom account um, through Neighbourhood Watch, but we've offered it to the community. So if anybody wants to use that, they're more than welcome to use it in their, in their ward panels. And it's about how we can help each other and also share um, ideas with each other so that they feel supported too, because we can't do it alone. We have to work as a community um, and move forward. And as councillors, it's really important for you to feel involved in that process too. I will shut up, because I do talk for England. I could be here for hours, so I'm being kind. Here you go. Thank you, Cheryl. 
And obviously, I'd just like to, to emphasise what Cheryl's just said, because obviously for us, you, you know, the war panels are the grassroots end of the business, and it's it's dealing with the little things that can actually have, you know, when somebody says what the problem is, it might seem quite small, but actually the impact that can have on somebody's life can, or the a community's life can, can be really quite significant. So the war panels meet quarterly, as I'm sure you know, and there's three priorities set from each war panel. One of them set by us, which is around violence, whatever is particular that, that given ward. But the other two are set by the panel themselves. So, you know, they're, up, they're getting us to target what they want us to target. And then obviously at subsequent meetings, they, they can hold us to account as well, whether the, the problem's been overcome, do they want to keep that as an ongoing problem or keep it going? And, you know, there have been challenges um, going from 17 wards to, to 23, but, you, you know, I think a lot of hard work done by the neighborhood, neighborhood board and, and my officers is, you know, we, we've been really lucky and it's come out well. Okay, um, uh, thank you for your presentation, and I'm really happy with, you know, the progress you've made. And, but can I be selfish here and ask about Thames Mead? Right, I'm one of those people who doesn't want Thames Mead to split. However, whether it's Thames Mead West, morning, north, east, is the Thames Mead. What is happening with Thames Mead in general? Because I don't think I have uh, been invited to any meeting at all. And I'm not sure whether any meeting is holding. Thank you. Okay, so um, the Thames Mead West and Thames Mead Moorings, um, it used to be just Thames Mead Moorings and part of Glyndon. Um, previously. So with the boundary changes, um, do apologise that, um, but don't blame us, blame the uh, Boundary Commission. Um, but we're working, you know, we're working within what we're doing. Um, so those areas used to be sort of managed as, uh, through Bexley um, because of um, the policing teams to have one big policing team there, sort of thing. Um, but I have on good authority we do have a Thames Mead West panel. Um, and if you um, send me your details, I will let you know, because uh, the sergeant for Woolwich has taken on uh, Thames Mead West. Um, and Thames Mead Moorings, um, it's the community forum at the Thames Mead Moorings um, that have taken on the challenge of doing um, doing wall panels and we're working with the Tensmead Moorings team, the Safer Neighbourhood Policing team, to um, make sure that they are being held regularly. We do have a, um, a chair um, and so they will be um, done Im imminently um, because we did have those challenges and we did a lot of work within those areas. Oh, yeah, so, but we did, doesn't matter what part of Thamesmead, my daughter lives in Thamesmead, you know, it's, and, you know, it's very important that people don't feel that they've missed, they're missing out. Thamesmead moor, Moorings, we've got the new Moorings Club with West Thamesmead, the challenge is obviously finding locations because they don't have a Thamesmead Mooring Club and they don't have a usual um, run the mill community centre. So it's looking at what those opportunities are, but I'm rest assured that there is a functioning ward panel and I will be visiting that on the next opportunity to go and give the support to the chair um, and make sure that they are, they feel supported um, and that if there's anything that they need um, to help them through. So it's not about, oh, we know there's a ward panel and we're gonna leave them to it. No, what help and support do they need? What does that look like? Is there anything that we can do? And we always ask them as well if they have um, know who their councillors are, they know who those key partners are. So it's, it's, it's an ongoing thing. It isn't just, um, oh, there's a wall panel. So let me know, both of you. 
I mean, guys, if you've got your cards with you tonight, yep, you can give them back. to Cheryl. Thank you, Chair. Um, firstly, just wanted to say a huge thank you to Cheryl for everything you've done since uh, taking over as Chair. A breath of fresh air, huge changes, um, and really pleased to see the updates on uh, those actions in the review. And I know that one of your team, Rob Sayers, um, has been a big part of it too. He's doing an excellent job uh, to go from one end of the borough to the other uh, in Mottingham, Cold Arbor, New Eltham. And, you know, we see each other all the time in community events, and I know how hard you work to engage um, residents uh, right across the borough and across the country, in fact. So a um, uh, huge thank you for, from, from us down at uh, the bottom of the borough. Um, two questions, really. One, I think, is for probably for Cheryl, and one is for Adrian. So um, for Cheryl, um, yeah, I've been a councillor nearly a decade and have been involved in lots of attempts to try and get more people engaged in the ward panel um, to, with varying degrees of success. Mm -hmm. And um, we've had more success l lately, thanks to Rob's efforts and your efforts. Um, but uh, I'm beginning to wonder whether the name is a bit of a barrier, just the fundamentally, do we need a rebrand, do you think? Interested in your view. Um, because when I'm speaking to residents, nobody really knows what a ward panel is. There's sometimes a confusion between the Safer Neighbourhood team in the Met Police structure and the Safer Neighbourhood Ward Panel, which is quite a tongue twister. Um, so I just wondered what your perspective is. Do you think that's a problem that might be looked at, or what do you reckon? There's too many neighbourhoods, I agree. Um, on, a, on my day job, we get many calls that should have been sent to the police, but they phone us because I work for Neighbourhood Watch. So there is too many neighbourhoods. However, um, I, when I, I didn't even know what a ward panel was, okay? So 10 years ago, I didn't know what a ward panel was because nobody talks about it. Nobody invites people. And this is the same problem you have with many different um, initiatives, etc. So the, the thing that we need to do is work together and talk to residents. So you as councillors, so every time you have somebody bringing an issue to you. Have, you. have you thought about joining the ward panel? Did you know that you, know, you have an opportunity? And there's also surveys that go out before the ward panels. So if they can't attend the ward panel, they can still feel engaged with it by highlighting what matters to them, what problems can they see in the area, or even celebrating the uh, successes that they've seen. You know, it's not all doom and gloom. It's, it's, there are many successes um, with, with neighbourhoods. And I, I understand, yes, there's too many neighbourhoods. But, you know, even if we just call it a ward panel, you know, you're a council of a ward. So, you know, it's, it's about how we communicate that out to people and engage with people and having those conversations at any level from the council, from the councillors, from the police, from um, representatives that are already on the panel talking with other residents. It, that's important. Okay, thank, thanks very much. Um, and Adrian, um, I was pleased to see in the update that um, there's an example, actually again in Thamesmead, where we had Bexley officers attending a Greenwich ward panel because it doesn't really matter to residents what side of an arbitrary line they're, they're in. And we have the same thing in Mottingham, Cold Harbour, New Eltham. In fact, I represent three and a bit communities, Mottingham, Cold Harbour, New Eltham, and three roads in Chiselhurst. Uh, so if you live in 27 um, Main Ridge Road, you're in Greenwich, and if you live next door at 25, you're in Bromley. And I raise this because, of course, that's a different BCU. And um, sometimes in our ward panel, uh, and again, similarly in Mottingham, it's split down the middle between Greenwich and Bromley. So um, sometimes we have issues raised at our ward panel and um, through no fault of their own, it's just not something that police officers on the Greenwich Ward can answer because it's been dealt with by their colleagues in Bromley. So it's good to see that the Bexley-Greenwich link is up and running. Could we maybe just take that away and, and think about how we can get the, the cross-border beyond the BCU to, for, for it to work a bit more smoothly, I guess? Um, I'd have to look into that because, to be honest, I didn't actually realise that was an issue because as far as I was aware, 
obviously all the wards are aligned with the councils, the war boundary. So if it was within Greenwich Ward, it, uh, you know, that, that shouldn't happen. But I will look into that. And just for the Thamesmead teams, the, the staff are staying the same apart from the supervisor. So the PCs and the PCSOs. And also when we have our community events in Kidbrook, um, to promote the new Met for London. We are looking at doing the next one in the Abbey Wood Thamesmead area because we are conscious you are out uh, on the corner. Um, you, 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 you know, so we obviously want to embrace them. And obviously during that meeting as well, we'll be raising the profile of the war panels to, to try and get, you know, encourage people to join. Yeah, no, we just literally sort the stage of sorting out the date, then we'll look at the venue and, of course... Remember to register in advance because Councillor Backen couldn't get into the Eltham one and he was turned away. So, On, on that, do apologise that some people couldn't get in, but we did stipulate they ne that they needed to register. However, we did say to people, if they waited 10 minutes after the after the beginning they could hear but if they waited 10 minutes just to make sure that those that did register hadn't attend wasn't there then they could go in and we were full to capacity and it was a really good event and we do apologize but do come to the next one thank you very much are the panel do you agree to note noted thank you very much indeed thank you and the next item on the agenda we here, is to note the, um, the commissioning of the future reports. Are you happy to note that? Thank you very much. <laughs> 